Um, I'm next going to hand it over to my colleague, um, Jessica, to introduce our next speakers. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Serena. And again, thank you to our speakers. It's just fantastic to hear from such incredible people who are true advocates of change. Um, like Serena said, my name is Jessica. I'm a fourth year medical student here at University of Michigan, and I'll be couples matching into general surgery. And I'm just extremely honored to be here today with you, this incredible group looking to make real change and an impact. Um, we're next going to do our second poll of the day. And so if you all can go ahead and click to that top right and click on the poll. And with that poll, is, is how much do you think changing of spatial poverty during childhood, so upward mobility out of a poorer neighborhood, can impact a person's earnings as an adult? Um, the options are it doesn't, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and 60%. And then we'll discuss this poll um, during the Q&A. So I'm really excited to be introducing our next three speakers for our HOPE Symposium. So first, we're going to have a remarkable talk by David Taylor. He's a senior associate dean for student learning at Georgetown University School of Medicine and the director of Georgetown Experimental Medical Studies Program, which targets underrepresented and disadvantaged students who aspire to the profession of medicine. He's been performing career-long work to increase and support underrepresented students in medicine. And he'll be talking today on learning how to learn in medicine, a professional competency to assure excellent health care to our valued patients. After from him, we'll hear from Dr. Luke Schaefer, the Herman and Amalie Kahn Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy, and Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement at the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. He's also Director of Poverty Solutions, an initiative that partners with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. And he'll be talking today with us on the cycle of poverty and health. And rounding out our great group of speakers is Dr. Victor Garcia. He's a professor and pediatric surgeon at the University of Cincinnati Department of Surgery. And he's committed his career to addressing inequalities children face in their urban communities. And he'll be speaking on the end of progress towards racial equality, why it matters, why we can't wait, where do we go from here? So again, as you did for our incredible speakers before, we encourage you all to submit questions for each speaker into the chat during their talks for the panelists to answer after their talks and make sure to indicate which speaker the question is for. And Mr. David Taylor will kick us off. Thank you. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to this segment of our HOPE Symposium. I am David Taylor, Senior Associate Dean for Student Learning at Georgetown University School of Medicine. And it's my honor to share with you the presentation this morning on learning how to learn in medicine. And as we think about learning how to learn in medicine, it is part of our competency to assure that we can provide quality healthcare to all of our valued patients. One of the nice contexts about the HOPE initiative and this beautiful collaboration is that we are focusing again on addressing social and advocacy needs of our patients and the neighboring communities, but equally important, how are we proactively engaging our community and empowering our community? And there are a lot of discussion around the educational inequities within our communities that affect underrepresented students or disadvantaged students who wish to aspire to medicine. And one of the areas I'm gonna focus on today is looking at some pipeline initiatives at the post-baccalaureate level after the students have graduated from the undergraduate context, while they're still in the undergraduate context and also at the high school level, as we seek at Georgetown as you do at your respective institutions to engage and empower your immediate communities, looking for those wonderful gifted scholars that we can nurture for service in medicine, providing them the skill sets to learn how to learn in medicine. So let's take a look at what we've been doing at Georgetown but what we see, first of all, at all of our institutions is, well, what's the problem? Isn't it true that, in fact, we can just make an instant MD? Listen, what you need is a competitive MCAT score. You need a great science grade point average. And you just don't really need to have anything else because the student is so smart. So 
it's minimal proactive support of that student, poof, an instant MD. What we're finding, first of all, irrespective of a student's background, all students need guidance on how to learn in medicine based on the advanced rigor and thinking skills competencies that are required to have the privilege to engage our valued patients in the most intimate aspects of their human being. But equally important, we recognize, again, because of a broad range of social contexts, that valued students who are underrepresented in medicine or disadvantaged may not have had an opportunity to have certain skill sets developed that prepare them for the rigor of medicine. So we need to be proactive as part of this initiative and others in engaging in that aspect of building the pipeline of future service-oriented leaders in medicine through our pipeline initiatives. Now, one such initiative or any such initiative should have some core components. And you note up here in this portion of the slide, I say you have your MD pipeline initiatives. And this could start again, elementary, middle school, high school, college level, post-baccalaureate level, but they all feed into our undergraduate medical education context, which is medical school. And as we teach students how to learn in medicine, that continues into the graduate medical education context and certainly into their context as a practicing physician as part of continuing medical education. You see, in fact, learning how to learn in medicine is truly a lifelong professional competency. Because again, we are gonna be problem solvers, compassionate and empathetic and how we engage our value patients but we have to have the requisite skill sets to do so. And all students can do so with an effective strategy. A strategy in learning that always says, how do I plan specifically my learning process? What are the tools to monitor how I'm learning? And then ultimately, how do I evaluate how I'm learning? And there's a key reflection skill that occurs in that process all the way through, irrespective of where you start an educational pipeline, all the way into your continuing practice. That's a constant type of learner success that is supported usually by effective medical educators like you and proactive team collaborators like you who partner together to make the whole process work in terms of your pipeline initiatives. So that's what we want to begin to look at more specifically now as we move into the presentation and the Georgetown Experimental Medical Studies Program, which is in essence an experiment in success for underrepresented students, many of whom come from the Washington DC community, but also across the United States, looking at how can we enhance their mastery of medical science? How can we enhance their understanding of their learning behaviors so they can adapt them for success in the future? Well, there's a wraparound process. Some say, what's your formula? The formula involves key components of high order thinking, which have to be part of any educational process and strategies to promote that. It has to involve learning behavior adaptation. There's certainly going to be mentor feedback, but without the focused learning behavior or higher thinking skills, there will not be change for the rigor of medicine. We also must look at what are the effective learning strategies that can be customized based on a particular student's learning preference. And all this involves a high degree of student accountability or learner accountability. This same model can be adapted all the way through the pipeline of medicine from the pipeline programs, undergraduate medical education, all the way to practicing physician. This is where we want to go. Look at the success that we've had. Now, these are valued students with very modest credentials in which many would say, hmm, I don't think they can be candidates for medicine with a science grade point average 
around the 2.0. And an MCAT, if you're looking only at cognitives now, the right standardized test scores and grades, and an MCAT may be around the 60th percentile rank. Mm, you would say no, but with a specific intervention, the answer is yes. We've been able to take a valid pool of students that have some areas of improvement and over the course of a year with an intervention, 78% are admitted to one of the most rigorous schools in the school of Me in, 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 in medicine, Georgetown School of Medicine, and 94% graduate in four years. Now, some will say, how do you do that with those data points? It's an intervention of how to learn in medicine. Another discussion, maybe we'll talk about that during the Q&A slides. Let's keep moving. So over the course of the program from 1977 to 2020, we've had 840 graduates of the GEMS program. And look at what we have. 62% of that pool are now practicing physicians. Certainly it's not 100%. Because with those very modest credentials, you would be expecting 0%. You now have 62% of outstanding physician leaders in the community that they have come from and now are empowering and continue to serve based on an intervention. So yes, the numbers tell some of the story, everyone does not have all of the competencies to have this privilege. But 62%, we've been able to show, if you're willing to work at it, do. And that's big. And 471 of those graduates from the 518 or 91% graduated from Georgetown School of Medicine. The remainder are graduating from other schools of medicine in the US, allopathic schools. We still have some of the pipeline in terms of others that are medical students still in the School of Medicine at Georgetown or other schools. And then those who are not successful, remember it's a continuing experiment success. Is there an opportunity to still have those students use their valued skill sets in other health professions? And the answer is yes. Let's talk about that during the Q&A section as to some of those other areas. So that's one of the successful contexts that we have at Georgetown. But remember, you actually have some Michigan blue in our Georgetown blue and gray. Here are three exemplars of graduates of the GEMS program at your valued institution. And look at what they're doing. One of them is the co-founder of this valued initiative, Dr. Adams Newman. Isn't that something? Would we have an initiative today if we did not think about a collaborative opportunity to engage these valued scholars and now physician leaders? Something to think about. So you're seeing it real time at the home base of Michigan, but this can be duplicated across the United States as we collaborate together. So we have some other pipeline programs. Let's go back a little bit further, undergraduate context. We have our Arches Academy, again, taking undergraduate students from underrepresented backgrounds in medicine or disadvantage and giving them the same type of competencies that you will see here that develop them into the future positions they can be with preparation. And update, three of the students here were in position to apply to medical school in this past cycle and we are privileged to receive two of those three will be at Georgetown. One will be at the other value medical school in the United States that will not be advertised, but it's an outstanding medical school too. They had choices. Isn't that wonderful? So pipeline programs work as we invest effort, structure, finance, and collaborative professional skill sets among the teams at our different universities. We can work together and we can make a difference in our local communities and share best practices to help our other colleagues in other communities. Isn't that right? All right. Then lastly, we also have a context where we can look at the students at the high school level. And the high school level is another great area to start with valued students in underrepresented communities or disadvantaged communities 
who show this interest in medicine. So we have a parallel process for those valued students. And you'll notice in both the ARCHES program, which is a collegiate or college program, and the high school program, we have partnered also to provide stipends to these valued students. So the work becomes longitudinal scholarship as they aspire to medicine. Isn't that a wonderful work? Isn't that a wonderful calling to have? And then to, again, take all of our expertise, faculty, valued staff, social workers, mentors in the community, other peers who've gone through the process, all coming together to support these valued students. Team, this is a work in progress. But you see, if we stay steadfast at it, we can get outcomes that in essence demonstrate in real time action, the hope collaborative. Now, I like to say possibilities become opportunities. Here are four outstanding physicians. Here are two cardiologists. Both of them are former gym students and graduates of Georgetown School of Medicine, now serving together in cardiology in Chicago. Here are two former gym students in an OR. This valued doctor is a urologist, and here is her anesthesiologist. Both former gym students now practicing together in Maryland. You see, as we plant the seeds and we work together collaboratively and you stay in the vineyard, we will see outcomes longitudinally. We have to be willing to invest those resources, both financial and human resource and expertise over time, and then we'll be blessed to see these outcomes. That's why, folks, we have the hope collaborative, and that's why we need your engagement together, your sharing of your expertise from your respective programs. Let's share it together, but more importantly, let's take those shared best practices and use them for the greater good. Well, it's time now to move to our valued next speaker, and so let's pay close attention to Dr. Luke Schaefer coming up next. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to be here with all of you. Um, and I wish we could all be in person, of course, uh, but hopefully uh, sometime in the future, that'll be possible. Um, as Dr. Taylor mentioned, my name is Luke Schaefer. I'm faculty at the Ford School of Public Policy in the School of Social Work, and I run this university-wide initiative called Poverty Solutions. Our mission is to partner with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. And when we think about different components of poverty, right? Poverty is sort of this amorphous thing. And sometimes I think about the fact that if I, if I went into my doctor's office and they diagnosed me as being sick, I would be pretty disappointed because that's too broad, right? I'd want to know much more about what's going on with me. And, and, um, and my doctor would be prepared to do that. With poverty, I think sort of similarly, we want to have this broad sort of idea of, of poverty, but also um, be able to drill down and diagnose uh, within that. One of the things that we are really seeing recently in our work, right, and our work is to partner with communities and uh, policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty is this intersection of, of poverty and health. Right? And when we think about those components of, of poverty, we're thinking about things like food insecurity. There are many American families that have difficulty putting healthy meals on the table uh, over the course of a month, right, or over the course of a year. We think about uh, housing insecurity, housing instability, right, where we know about sort of visual homeless of, of people who are um, on on the street, people who are in um, in uh, shelter, uh, but the less visible component of that, right? So a lot of my work focuses on families with kids. And the less visible component is uh, doubling up, right? Where people are sort of couch surfing and moving from home to home. Uh, we think about 
barriers to access, right, of a job. If somebody is seeking employment, can they get there, right? The transportation barrier. Can they get to their to their health appointment? And uh, if they can get their child uh, cared for, right, if we're thinking about child care, is it a safe place for the child, right? So all of these things uh, match up. And we really think uh, at Poverty Solutions about poverty as a set of sort of interlinked systems, right? We think about housing systems and we think about transportation. We think about workforce development and access to jobs. And all of these systems sort of go independent and health is a big piece of that. Um, but they're all interlinked. And you can think about all those things I just mentioned. If somebody can't get uh, healthy foods, right? Have, has a difficulty getting healthy foods on the table. Either they, they live in a, in a food desert of sorts, right? Where it's hard to get fresh foods or vegetables or they just don't have enough income, right? And so the other options, the cheaper options that are often less healthy, uh, I think you all know, right? What the impacts of that are on health and development for children. Um, what about housing, right? We think about um, both the environmental aspect of it, right? Of uh, people who are low income being more likely to live in spaces that are, um, uh, you know, in the environmental exposure is uh, bad for their health in a very physical way. Um, we also sort of think about like that instability factor, right? When we look at kids who are doing this doubling up and are couch surfing because they can't afford a place to live, we know that it, uh, it can affect them physiologically, right? Where um, their uh, sort of stress level remains elevated. And so they are sort of going from house to house. They um, don't know where they're going to be next. Maybe sometimes these situations are not safe situations. And uh, so it can impact, right? It sort of raises that cortisol level um, and, and uh, impacts school performance um, and can sort of basically sort of wear the body down. So we can definitely think about ways that um, these social determinants, broadly speaking, impact health. And, and in fact, you know, my understanding is uh, the current literature suggests more than 80% of how healthy a person is, is driven not by care, but by these social determinants, right? And so trying to unpack that and make sure that we're addressing those uh, is the key. And uh, but maybe we can also think about sort of the circular causation, right? Where we also think about uh, poor health. Maybe it's not driven by the social determinants, but um, by uh, genetic factors. Um, maybe it's behavior. Uh, how these things then also impact the social determinants. So, you know, as a social scientist, I love to be able to sort of focus on that causality, right? And say, you know, X impacts Y, but in this case, we're definitely in a space where Y also impacts X, right? The, the less healthy I am, uh, the more likely it is I'm not going to be able to maintain a job over the long run. I'm not going to be able to sort of manage my life, right, in a way where um, I can uh, be successful and sort of get out of that place. So you really have things going in um, both directions. And trying to sort of unpack that is the, it's a question, right? How do we do that? So at, at Poverty Solutions, we like to think about um, doing things small, medium, and large that make systems work better for families. A lot of the, a lot of the ways that we've tried to intervene in poverty has been, over history, has been individual-based, right? I, I like to say that if a, if a single mom wants to go find a place that can tell her all the things that she's doing wrong in her life, uh, she would have infinite possibilities, right? There are just, there is a type of provider who will tell her, um, you know, she's managing her money wrong. She's interacting with her children wrong. She's sort of approaching the labor market in the wrong way. And I think, you know, there's uh, uh, a lot to be said for individual level approaches, you know, of course, to me, the more that they can be strength-based, the better. Um, but often we should think about systems, right? And how people are impacted by the system uh, within which they exist. And that can be sort of the big picture type stuff, 
right? Where we can think about um, maybe there are huge ways that we want to restructure our systems to work better. Uh, a lot of conversations these days about um, universal basic income, and maybe we just get rid of a lot of the programs that are meant to target financial insecurity, which we know sort of drives poor health, uh, with something that's just a lot more stable. It deals with the volatility in, in income that's really come to sort of represent how people are acting. And uh, Medicare for all, right? That's another bold proposal on the table. And we can have tons of debates about whether or not that type of proposal would positively impact healthcare delivery in a way that reduces disparities. Um, so we can have those really big and long conversations, but there are also, I think, ways uh, on a on a day to day basis that we can think about uh, how we deliver our programs in a way that enhances outcomes for families, and and how thinking about the way that the programs that we're uh, our families are embedded in, right? In this case, patients, right? Um, how do they sort of work? Um, at that level. And uh, we've tried to do a lot of this in uh, with the city of Detroit. So we have a partnership with the mayor's office where we've looked at things like tax foreclosure. And it turns out um, something like 40% of all homes in the city of Detroit have been lost to tax foreclosure um, over the last decade or so. And that was a, a result of a lot of systems level problems. And there were things small, medium, and large we could do to change that, right? We could change the way that the tax foreclosure auction operated to try to make sure that people who were renting homes would give the be give the first chance to own that home uh, if uh, if the landlord wasn't paying the property taxes. Uh, there are ways that we can make sure that people have access to their um, uh, uh, a program called the poverty property tax exemption, where they can actually have their uh, tax liability waived um, in, uh, they can have the tax liability waived uh, if they prove low income. And it was incredibly hard to get for a long time. And those things usually take partnership, right? So they sort of, they mean looking outside of the very small part of the puzzle that we work on and trying to work uh, in this case, like with city government, um, trying to work with uh, corporate partners like Quicken Loans, the Rock uh, Community Venture uh, Community uh, Investment Fund has been a big partner with us on this, and uh, trying to practically problem solve. Uh, in healthcare, right, some of the things that I've seen, so in my own work, I'm both uh, a data nerd, I love uh, spreadsheets and um, you know, analyses that try to use big data to try to understand our programs. I've also spent a lot of time uh, getting to know uh, very, very poor families, especially for a book I wrote uh, with Kathy Eaton called $2 a Day. And in that process, uh, we both tried to look at large scale quantitative data about what was going on with the very poorest families in the United States and also get to know them over time. And one of the challenges that we identified there was a lack of access to cash, right? So families might have food assistance a lot of times they didn't have any, any money when they uh, experienced a crisis. What was always interesting to me was that they, they, would have, uh, they might not have any money in the household. They might have food assistance. They might feel they have to sell, uh, traffic their food assistance in order to uh, get that little bit of money to pay for toilet paper or um, maybe keep the utility bill on. Um, but they always had... Uh, or I should say almost always had public health insurance, right? And that was really interesting to me that uh, our programs do a lot better with coverage, right, of health insurance than um, like cash assistance or any other sort of means tested aid. So um, that led me to sort of take a look at uh, federal spending. And I wrote a paper uh, about a year ago with some colleagues where we, we took a look at this and just tried to compare sort of the different pots of spending. And I'm going to ask our, um, to, to put up sort of slide one that I have. And what we noticed is, uh, you know, if we go back, right, and think about what we were talking about at the very beginning, um, that 80% uh, of, uh, of a person's health, right, it's determined by these social determinants, 
we see a, a, a great deal of spending, right? So if you look at this figure one that I have up as my first of two slides, um, Medicaid, you know, represents something along the lines of just under $450 billion in spending, uh, whereas food assistance is at the 60 to $70 billion mark. The EITC, um, that's a sort of a refundable tax credit, right? It's about that. And then our other program, the sort of cash welfare program, um, is down at like $16 billion, right? And if we go to the, the second slide, we see... So if we sort of tally up all of the spending, what we do in terms of means-tested um, aid for health, right? We see it ends up going at about uh, $464 billion. That's compared to $154 billion in cash and another $124 billion in near cash. So still over half of what we spend, relatively speaking, on sort of in uh, means-tested aid, right? Aid for low-income families is in health. So over the long term, if we think about um, what we're doing in the long term, uh, you know, what is the, the debate about whether or not we should right the ship on this a little bit? Not to say that, that health isn't a good investment, right? But say, should we bring some of these other items more in line uh, with that, that figure on health? And I know we can also debate sort of, you know, with Medicaid, especially what is, um, you know, really the amount that goes to low-income families versus in life stuff. But still, any way you cut it, right, we spend vastly more on health than in any of these other buckets. And within health, uh, my encouragement is to just think about the way small, medium, and large, we can make this system work better. So in my case, right, as I got to know families, and they had no cash, but they often um, – they virtually all had access to public health insurance or at least children in the family said, what was striking was how many different sort of types of providers uh, were in people's lives, right? And, and so I, I would actually, families would often have like a medication table where I would see a whole set of drugs. And as an outsider, right, I'm a, I'm a doctor, as my children remind me, I'm not a real doctor um, as a PhD. Um, the question, the open question was, uh, to what extent do we think sort of that huge slate often of medications that people were on was, was something that anybody was sort of coordinating at a systems level? And to what extent uh, do we think that families who are housing insecure, who are moving a lot, are going to be able to complete treatment regimens um, over time? And we can even look sort of inside our um, offices, right? We can think about questions like, is there, are there differences in the quality of care, right? Or the types of care that I provide to folks who come in who are low income, right? Or folks who are people of color compared to my other patients. Um, and what about sort of the waiting room, right? And how I interact with people. So my encouragement is sometimes I think when we think about social determinants, we think about this huge, broad sort of concept, right? And it's really hard to to, to tunnel down into. And I don't want you not to think some, some in that way, right? To sort of think about the whole. But as we're thinking about the whole, as we're thinking about sort of big picture changes that we might make, I think we can also think from day to day about how our practices, how our health systems are designed in a way to try to make the systems work as well as they can for families who are struggling, families who are always going to have a lot of challenges. And I think if we're able to do that, right, so if we could have wins on a weekly basis, uh, say, you know, we changed, we changed an intake, we changed a health screening so that we actually know something about social determinants. Um, you know, we made changes. We did more to make sure care is coordinated across our healthcare system. I think our families will be better off for it and will be better off for it. Thank you so much for uh, the chance to spend some time with you today, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Victor Garcia. Thank you, Luke, for that very warm introduction, and good morning, everybody. Uh, Vic Garcia here from Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, I have the uh, sort of pleasure of sort of chatting with you about a really a rather somber topic, and that is the end of progress toward racial equality in this country, why it matters to all of us, uh, why we can't wait, and where do we go from here? 
So the things that I'm going to sort of uh, explore with you is whether the neighborhoods of opportunity, uh, that's going to be a central theme. I'm going to chat about toxic stress and allostatic load, which I consider the germ theory of our uh, generation. Uh, do we move out or move up in our neighborhoods? Uh, I want us to really appreciate that neighborhoods where Blacks live are differences, not so much of degree, but of kind, and that there's an increased vulnerability of Black boys as far as neighborhood disadvantage which really then brings to us this absolutely seminal need for us to transform disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods uh, and that this is a necessary, but not a problem to be solved, but a complex challenge that we need to embrace. Let's begin a little bit by exploring why things are so different, uh, not just in degree, but kind. What Raj Chetty has demonstrated is, is that we have two Americas and the geography of upward Mobility by race demonstrates that these two Americas are dramatically different. And as you can see on this slide, that the vast proportion of black men live in areas where there's very little upward social mobility. And as you think about this in, in, in the context of the American dream, which we so take such pride of in the United States, African-Americans and blacks are more likely to start at the bottom of the income and wealth distributions, as you can see from this uh, this, car this cartoon on the lower left. But most notably, despite the optimism of the time as far as the civil rights movement, Blacks are more likely to stay in the bottom and fall from the middle class. These racial differences in residential environment is not something new. It's something that uh, Bill Wilson uh, back in the 1990s demonstrated that of the 171 largest cities in the United States, there's not even one city where whites live in equal conditions to those blacks. And Rob Sampson, now at Harvard, uh, but was at the University of Chicago, demonstrates then that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. And the consequences are of excess deaths for the black population totaling uh, almost 4 million between 1940 and 1999, and about 90 some odd to 100,000 Blacks die of excess mortality each year. The worst places for poor white children are almost all better than the best places for Black children. And this is a phenomena that I think we need to appreciate that fewer than 5% of Black children currently grow up in areas with a poverty rate below 10%. Otherwise, 90 some odd percent of black children grow up in areas which do not promote upward social mobility. And this is something that's not attributed to sort of ability or non-cognitive skills. It really is as a consequence of differential exposure to materially deprived and toxic neighborhoods with long-term consequences. Again, despite 50 years of gains in civil rights. For us in Cincinnati, this is a wake up call. And you'll see on the slide on the, on to your left uh, that Cincinnati is number 43 out of the top 50 as far as upward social mobility. For those of you who live in, uh, in Michigan, you'll see that the Detroit, Michigan is 46 or 48. Again, the implication here from research from Ross Shetty is, is that uh, if you don't move out before you're 10 or 11 years of age, you're going to be stuck there for the rest of your life. So what we're seeing here is that this income inequality between blacks and whites is driven entirely by what is happening among these boys and the men they become. And it cannot be explained by individual household traits, but actually it's the surrounding neighborhoods, the economy, and the broader society that views black boys differently from white boys and even for black girls. This poverty, this concentrated poverty, affects every single aspect of the human physiology, from the prefrontal cortex to reproductive organs. It has implications as far as the ability for pre-school education to achieve its ends. Uh, and you'll see here from a study that was done that evidence, though, shows that pre-K-induced improvements in learning are detectable during elementary Many of the studies actually show either null or negative long-term uh, consequences. And this is, appropriate, uh, this is pr principally as a consequence of the compounded deprivation of minority youth, again, boys much more 
harshly affected than girls, but also because of this phenomenon of toxic stress, which is, has been inextricably implicated with the concentrated disadvantage in these neighborhoods. Young girls born, born at one month of age have been shown to have very significant changes in their uh, cortical gray and deep gray matters as far as their brain architecture. The biological implications of work done by Martha Farah and others shows again uh, that early life adversity as a result of being in these neighborhoods of disadvantage uh, impair executive function, uh, working memory, cognitive control, impaired emotional regulation and social functioning, a whole host of factors that really impair the ability of this child to learn and to be a productive citizen uh, when he or she grows up. The Nobel Prize uh, winner, James Hexman, Heckman, who really prom promulgated uh, the whole thing about early childhood uh, success and uh, early childhood education, along with Jack Chonkoff, a noted pediatrician whose work in this area is highly regarded, has concluded that the most efficient strategy for strengthening the future workforce, both economically and neurobiologically, is by improving the quality of life is to invest in the environments of disadvantaged children during their early childhood years. This neighborhood disadvantage also explains why certain neighborhoods, i.e. predominantly black segregated and impoverished neighborhoods have higher rates of crime. And what Samson has also demonstrated is, is that if you look at any ethnicity with the same degree of exposure to neighborhood disadvantage as African-Americans are, you'll see the same variations as far as crimes are concerned. And it's not because of the individuals in these neighborhoods, it's what the neighborhood does to the individual. We now know that if we improve the opportunities for economic mobility, particularly for those of us who are looking at how do we increase the representation of minorities in the workforce, in healthcare professions, is that we have to change then the spatial poverty at a young age. And the successes are really quite well demonstrated as the work by Shetty has demonstrated here. A child who moves up increases their earnings in adult by 30%, making them more likely to go to college. And uh, we can then uh, see that we would have a much larger pipeline uh, coming into such institutions of higher learning that, like the University of Michigan. It's a wake up call for all of us. Again, if we don't move out before the age of 11, okay, that child will be there for the rest of their lives. And it's not only a matter of a social um, responsibility, uh, but it also reflects the fact that uh, if we were able to close this racial wealth gap, if we were able to increase the upward social mobility, the McKinsey and company, as well as Citigroup and other notable funding uh, financial institutions have shown that there would be a substantial increase in GDP by closing this racial wealth gap, four to 6% higher by uh, 2028. So what I'm arguing for and what I'm advocating and what I ask you to consider is, is that a singular focus on individual income mobility is misleading. Uh, neighborhood mobility has its own logic and, it's, and demands its own independent inquiry uh, that we need to look at policies that actually look at the spatial foundations of inequality and specifically look at changing the neighborhoods themselves and not solely focusing on the individual. What I am strongly arguing for that we consider then moving out, moving out uh, by intervening holistically at the community level and renewing the existing and historically disinvested neighborhoods uh, with, and, and by investing in them uh, and providing them with new resources. You know, what the poor people want is not to be moved out into less poor neighborhoods. They want the neighborhoods that they close call home uh, to have the same resources uh, that those lower poverty neighborhoods have. They want to get away from the violence, drugs, gangs, poor performing schools. And what I've tried to demonstrate in the, these few uh, minutes is that the violence that's in these in neighborhoods and the gangs and the poor performing schools are a consequence of historic disinvestment. Okay, Poor residents want what anybody else wants. And what we're suggesting here is, is that what we need to think about is an affirmative action for neighborhoods where people can stay in place at the community level, but still move up and realize improved lives and access to needed uh, resources. Samson, I think, puts it most eloquently in that we need to look at not just contextual, not just individual mobility, 
but contextual mobility, okay, recognizing the salience of compounded deprivation that little black boys and little black girls are exposed to in segregated neighborhoods. This requires durable community place-based interventions, recognizing the racial penalties that have persisted for so long, and the investment then in place-based interventions that really embrace the complexity that's inherent in transforming these neighborhoods. Disadvantaged neighborhoods are not a problem to be solved. No, we've tried that. It's a complex challenge to be embraced, and we have to be humble to the fact that we are blind to our blindness. So we have very little idea of how little we know. Uh, we're designed in exactly that way. And so this, again, then raises to the forefront of our consciousness the importance of complex challenges and the need for complex interventions. I invite you to take a look at this recent book that just came out. Uh, our, your own Scott Page has a very, very seminal chapter in it about complex adaptive systems of systems. It's titled Complex Systems and Population Health. Okay. And it also, I think, builds on some earlier work that Scott Page has done, and he arguably will sort of discuss it later uh, in the course of the day, that we need to harness complexity and that these changes will improve our ability to predict outcomes identify effective policy changes, design institutions, and ultimately transform society beginning by transforming the neighborhoods. This complex problem space of human health is something that has been widely appreciated by the National Institutes of Health, appreciating that it's not just the individual family, but it's also the genomic level, as we've seen with epigenetics, as well as what's happening not just in the neighborhood, but also at the national and global economic level. As NIH has sort of established the system science and health uh, to look at funding for opportunities to transform these neighborhoods. And one of the approaches that I'm very much an advocate of is the social innovation lab, a fundamental systems change approach. Uh, it really talks about then looking at the system across all scales and it embraces a full process of transformation from the beginnings of good ideas, because everybody has lots of good ideas, but actually bringing up interventions that bring about broad social change. And this is a lab that is necessary when we're looking at social change as opposed to change of uh, mechanical systems, because it really requires then an engagement of people who typically and historically have not been at the table and it needs to be highly designed and expertly facilitated process. Well, I appreciate your having me here today. And at this point in time, I'll pass you back to Erica and Jessica. Wow. Thank you so much. Speakers are just phenomenal today. And I'm always just blown away and learn so much. And it's so great to see you. Dean Taylor, um, Luke, Vic, people, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, I'm going to jump right in because we have a few questions, and then we have questions that we're taking from the audience as well. This first question is for Dean Taylor. Given the success of the GEMS program, is there a secret formula that you can share with us for incorporation into some of our educational initiatives? Absolutely. We say everyone should lean closely so we can get the secret. Well, first, it's going to start with stakeholders. And it always starts with catalysts. And the HOPE initiative, again, is a great example of catalysts because without strategic leaders pushing the process, it will not happen. And so we've been very fortunate to have a strategic number of leaders and faculty and staff who've been supportive of the different initiatives that we have at Georgetown. Uh, secondly, once you have the catalyst in place, then we have to know based on our local school context, what are our goals? What are our standards for our particular university? Because as some of us know, remember Tip O'Neill, he would say all politics is local. We have to know 
where we want to move together because we have to have the support of multiple teams, our basic science faculty, our clinical faculty, others who support them, as well as our finance team who's going to provide resources uh, to fund the process. So it can be a multifaceted sort of support that will be needed to move forward. Now that you have the infrastructure, you have the catalyst bringing the project forward, you have your faculty on board, now we need the outstanding educators. Almost as if you're taking what you're doing with your P20 partnership right now in Mary Grove, that core competency of having excellence in teaching, modeling excellence in teaching, and building relationship, understanding learning, learner motivation, all of those components that are occurring right now at Mary Grove, just transpose that in any part of the pipeline. That's what it really takes as a starting point because the learner will know that you are invested in his or her success. If he or she does not know that you're invested in their success, you cannot take advantage of their desire to embrace the new learning strategies, their desire to be resilient, to adapt certain learning behaviors now for the rigor that's gonna come as they pursue medicine. As we looked at that video early of the young students at Mary Grove, and you saw the team building, yes, but you also saw, if you look very carefully, relationship building with those excellent teachers, relationship building and trust, relationship building that you are going to help me reach my goals. That is what we call a non-cognitive behavior that must be present not only in your valued students who are aspiring to the profession, but it must also be in your teachers. Because if that's not there, the process will not work. That is your biggest ingredient, is full investment. As uh, Ms. Lewis Jackson said, being able to understand that if you're developing, if you're developing and investing, you must be able to see what? Hope in what seems to be impossible. You have to see hope in what seems to be impossible. The first panel, along with our colleagues here, was outstanding because Dr. Marsh also reminded us you have to be intentional. So you can be indifferent or you can be intentional toward a solution. And Dr. Board reminded us that you have to unlearn certain beliefs. You have to unlearn that sterilized test scores in science grade point average tell the whole story. They do not tell the whole story. They tell a very important part of the story. But if you're willing to make an investment, you can move those valued students with excellent education and the infrastructure to that next level because you now have to teach new learning strategies. So that third component has a lot wrapped up in what we've already seen earlier from the presentations, but it also was wrapped up in what Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Garcia talked about in terms of where our valued students may be coming from the valued communities and what they've experienced. This is why the relationship building is so important. And we've seen that in gyms. We've had students who had food insecurity. We've had students that we found that were sleeping in the medical school because of housing insecurity. The complexity of the challenges Dr. Garcia stated is really large, but it must be embraced. So we need everyone working together for that process, right? So it's not just the bubble of, hey, you have the catalyst, hey, you have the educators, now we have everyone motivated moving forward. Those wraparound components are also equally important. And that's what we've been able to sustain to assure the success of GEMS. And now once you have those ingredients, when you model the standards, when you model the standards, as Dr. Boyd said, unlearn the belief that the student cannot reach or exceed that standard. He or she can if you have the right type of teaching excellence. huh? And that's what you're developing in your P20 partnership that facilitates that. And those are the main ingredients that any program can put together 
but it's more than a notion, isn't it? It's more than a notion to secure the resources. It's more than a notion to overcome the politics of what may happen to institutions and say, we want to make this investment. So we need strategic advocates and strong leaders. It's more than a notion to build relationship with valued students who have multiple things going on in their communities, as Dr. Garcia and Dr. Schaefer said. See, that's more than a notion. That takes investment. And so that is the true ingredient, intentionality with that process and being able to move those components together. And yes, you can see great outcomes as many of us have seen in some of our pilot programs, now, of course, we're trying to expand those to larger programs. Dean Taylor, I, I do have a follow-up question to, to that. And my question is how the GEMS program is, is very successful and is in its you know 25 plus years now. Mm -hmm. How do you make the case for a program like this at um, other medical schools? Let's take a look at what Dr. Garcia just showed us. So if we go from the perspective of this is an actually an urgent context where we need everyone involved in medicine, then we have opportunities to tap all of the possibilities for excellence. And it means that instead of simply looking at the context where people have already Right, They have the educational resources, they have the finances, and they can be nurtured and developed, so on and so forth. The question really becomes also, are we addressing the other areas that we know are there? And he just outlined it for us. And what can we do for an intervention? And so as we then look at our institutions and we look at our respective missions, this is where the catalyst and the leadership comes into play because you can have a mission that says you want to have a diverse workforce that serves and provides quality health care for all, so on and so forth, we all have it. But we need strong leaders to say, what are you actually doing to make that happen? What is going to be your commitment? Now with Georgetown, we've been able to frame it within the context of the Jesuit mission. So you may look at the uh, history of the institution, Jesuit mission says, empower underserved communities. So we're going to be a hypocrite or we're going to actually do it, right? We put that out on the table. And remember, it's more than a notion, as you said. And so the goal is to begin to look at what do we stand for as institutions in terms of opportunity, as you have framed it by the whole collaborative. And then what is the institution going to do with critical leaders to make that happen? One of the key pieces that helps institutions make this decision, of course, is outcomes. So we have to have evaluation and evidence-based outcomes along the way. And we've been able to demonstrate that now. And I want to thank you for only mentioning the 25 years, because, you know, once I tell everyone that it's been 43 years, you can see the gray in my hair. I want to thank the tech people, though, for lighting me up a little bit so you don't see the gray, okay? So the bottom line is, is that it's still going to go back to that local context, right? And what is the mission? How is the institution engaging the community? Is it framed by what you have as the objectives of the HOPE initiative? Do people really believe in that? Because that's going to be the driver. And you're going to need some catalyst to actually drive that process. And then once you have people listening, yes, I think we do, need, we, we, we do need to do something, but what and how can we do it? Then some of the various model programs around the United States of those in the audience, some of those model programs may be exemplars to potentially adapt for your specific context, right? And you go from there. And so the case is becoming difficult unless one as Dr. Boyd says, unlearn certain beliefs. You can believe, well, everything is fine. There are, there are more people. There's a more diverse workforce to some extent. There's, there's greater access, isn't there? I mean, everything is relative. There's less uh, challenges with access to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So you can choose to believe that or you can work in reality. 
That's why this symposium and others like it and the action items that come out of it are so important because they keep it front and center. Thank you so much, Dean Taylor. The next question is for Dr. Schaefer. The graphs that you presented showed us um, in such reality that health-related and Medicaid costs are markedly higher than other programs directed at social determinants of health, which may actually prevent injury and illness. Can you expand on how your program, Poverty Solutions, works to help individuals in this way? And further, maybe share your thoughts on what we as a healthcare system can do to help. Great, thank you. It's uh, really a treat to be here with all of you, and I've appreciated Dr. Taylor and Dr. Garcia's uh, remarks. I'll be reflecting on them. Um, and uh, I think we sort of lay out the challenges, right? When you have poverty at an individual level, and we know all the ways that that can impact health, we know health can impact uh, poverty, but then you start to think about the structures, right? You start to think about the neighborhoods, um, and uh, Dr. William Julius Wilson, as Dr. Garcia mentioned, talking about sort of the clustering of, of people into neighborhoods, of segregation, of racial segregation, um, that is imposed as a matter of policy, right? That these are, these are not things that just happen on accident. And so at Poverty Solutions, we really like to think about taking a, a perspective of a structural system level perspective on addressing poverty. Thinking about all the systems and processes at small, medium, and large levels that sometimes often don't work like they should for families who are most economically vulnerable. And thinking about how can we intervene in those systems, right? How can we make change? And and so some of that looks very big. And I think this question of where do we put our money is a big part of that, right? So we see that we spend a great deal more on access to, to healthcare for, especially for poor children, poor families, um, than we do on food assistance or cash assistance. And just trying to grapple with what that means and where we should be putting our money. Should we um, have uh, more resources put into uh, cash transfers or income support that can help with food insecurity, that can help with housing instability, that then uh, can reduce sort of the health, rip, the rippling effects of health uh, throughout the system. And would we be better off for that? That's a big picture change. And interestingly, we've had quite a bit of evidence in the last year on this front. So the response of the federal government to the economic crisis that came along with the public health crisis, uh, that economic crisis was like nothing that we've ever had, right? We saw not just like huge employment losses and a huge and immediate strain on the system of our unemployment insurance system, which by the way, was not well set up to, to help uh, vulnerable workers beforehand. Um, and it was just like an economic crisis like we've never, we, we just haven't had certainly in my lifetime. And the federal government responded in a way that it has never, like it never has responded before, which was broadly available access to income support through cash. It greatly expanded access to unemployment insurance, a program that doesn't help low and moderate income workers all that well in normal times and definitely doesn't help workers of color um, in an equitable way. We expanded that so that twice as many people have been accessing that program as in any uh, other economic crisis. And we increased the benefits for a period and uh, recognizing that sort of the amounts that we were spending were too low for families to be able to make ends meet. And then we added on top of that these uh, um, stimulus payments. And the, the thing about the stimulus payments that was different from anything we've ever done before was that they reached down to the very bottom. When we've done these sort of refunds before, we said you have to have a certain amount of cash, right? You have to have, have had a certain amount of earnings to get them. And we changed that and we said, there's still a process to apply, it's not immediate, but even if you had zero earnings, you can still access this. And the results have been astounding in a lot of ways. When you think about sort of the economic cliff that we were going off of, if we look at last summer, 
as all of these benefits start to roll in, we see that um, all of these markers of uh, financial well-being suggest that some families who fell through the gaps of this, they were still in crisis. But on the whole, we really buffered people against sort of a cataclysmic fall off the economic cliff that I think a lot of us expected. You didn't see a huge surge in evictions. You didn't see a huge number of utility shutoffs. And, you know, there's this famous Federal Reserve Bank estimate of people saying, could you handle a $400 unexpected expense among low-income Americans? The fraction during last summer, during the, the COVID crisis, that said they could handle that kind of expense actually went up. It actually improved from the previous year. That's remarkable. And... It, you know, I think it goes to show that when you do, when you provide income support, and you say, you know what, people deserve sort of a stable place so that they can't fall underneath. And you trust people that people do crazy things like pay their rent and they pay their utility bill. Again, that system was not perfect, but it was fundamentally different from anything that we've done before. And I think sort of shows that moving forward, we can do more to help families take this sort of libertarian perspective, the families know the best, you know, best how to improve their circumstances, and we can trust them with that. And that's a part of the safety net that I think all the evidence on social determinants suggests we should be having a much stronger conversation about going forward. So that's big picture, right? And huge, uh, you know, national level debates. Yeah. If we think about our, our systems, right, if we think about uh, the health systems or the work that we do, we think that for every big sort of transformational type policy there is, there's also decisions every week. There's probably a decisions every day where we can make the systems that we work in more or less equitable, more or less equitable by race, more or less equitable by socioeconomic status. And we have to look for those opportunities, right? How do, how do people get appointments at our clinic, right? How do they sign in? Who do they have to talk to? Um, what hours are we open? Uh, what are our providers trained in, right, to recognize? Are we screening for social determinants of health? And if we are screening, are we doing anything about those? And then I think taking a close look at some of the questions about, um, do we change the way that we do uh, treatments based on our perceptions of people? Uh, maybe it's race or maybe it's socioeconomic status and what's behind those? Uh, lots of evidence, right, that, um, that, that Americans sort of, uh, that adults tend to think of young black boys as older than they are, right, and more culpable for things rather than treating them like kids. All of those sorts of things, how do those impact the interactions that we have? But training people is sort of one thing uh, that's incredibly important, right, and making sure that our our health providers are aware of all of these things, but then looking at the systems level and thinking about like, what can we change in the way that we implement that can be more equitable across these things? And thinking about the things that we could do this week, let's not wait for the transformational change, let's not wait for a huge plan, but say, is there something we could identify this week that we could change that would improve the system. And by tallying up those, I think we can make uh, a lot of progress. Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. And that actually brings me to a question we have for Dr. Garcia. And, you know, I, I've learned this for, from him, and he, he always says, you know, we, when it comes to these issues, we don't have time. We don't have time and we can't wait. So, Dr. Garcia, can, in the context of the work that you're doing and have done in Cincinnati, what do you say to people in other cities, a city like Ann Arbor or even Detroit or Chicago, but how do we expand the work and some of the work that you're doing more broadly into other cities, or is it too complex? Uh, well, Erica, it, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's never too complex. I mean, if you think about uh, the moonshot uh, where President Kennedy uh, challenged the nation to put a man in the moon or pay, put a person on the moon uh, in 10 years, 
And at that particular point in time when he made that declaration, uh, we did not have the technology or the tools available. Uh, but yet, not only did we put someone on the moon, but it was accomplished within eight years. I think that um, perhaps, you know, when we ask the question rhetorically, is it too complex? We underestimate the ingenuity of uh, mankind. And, um, you know, I'd like to say that, um, you know, for the history of mankind is the history of really achieving the, the impossible, you know, whether it's flight, something as rudimentary as, as flight, uh, or is it the computer uh, itself or quantum physics or quantum mechanics? I mean, to me, one of the challenges that I see in sort of, you know, arguing as far as looking at this as a complex challenge and not as a problem to be solved, is, is that a problem to be solved, I mean, it, it, it's inviting, you know, you can do good. Uh, but I would argue that it, because, because of the complexity of these issues, if we want to put ourselves out of business as someone taking care of children who are born premature or taking care of gunshot wounds among people of color, uh, which is increasing, uh, we need to think of, about, uh, uh, about, about the complexity, inherent complexity, and as a consequence of sort of recognizing that these are complex challenges, that they are our current tools to dealing with just simple problems that can be solved are totally ineffective. Uh, and that's where complexity science, that's where the NIH, that's where the Aspen Institute, uh, that's where the National Academy of Medicine has all, all of these entities have said, look, if you want to apply science as evidence for these public policies, you need to look, step back and s recognize what is complex, what is a complex challenge and what is a problem to be solved. Now, please don't misconstrue my statement. I mean, if there's something that child is bleeding, you've got to go ahead and stop the bleeding. But we also need to look at why is that child in an environment uh, that results in people of color being disproportionately killed, right, uh, and shot with homicides and suicides now being one of the leading causes of death for uh, the impoverished, the poor, uh, and, and, and in our urban neighborhoods. So it when we step back and say this is a complex challenge, then we have to then, it begs the question, uh, what are the tools that we need? And by uh, going back to my earlier sort of illustration as far as the moonshot, uh, if we then say, okay, maybe just uh, taking care of the, you know, providing homes for the homeless, uh, better aid uh, for those who are hungry, um, uh, perhaps getting more efficient and delivering uh, you know, medicines to those who are, uh, you know, don't have a medical home, uh, maybe we need to now say, okay, how do we go about this uh, to change the system such that we don't have 95% of black boys growing up in neighborhoods uh, that do not promote upward social mobility with obvious implications, not only as far as their health, uh, but their cognitive ability. Uh, now, again, I have to really emphasize that it's not immutable, but what if everybody uh, in these neighborhoods, because they're transformed, uh, don't need a special program? Uh, <laughs> I mean, let's, let's challenge ourselves to think about that, you know, uh, so that we're not sort of coming up with innovative ways to help people that if we really looked at the systems that were generating these disparities, uh, that uh, that money uh, could be spent um, in a you know in, in a different fashion. Uh, so that's 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 what bugs me. Uh, that's what frustrates me, and that's what also motivates me. Uh, and uh, you know we, we see examples of how come other other uh, entity industries where uh, people have applied to complex uh, systems thinking, uh, most notably the, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, um, economy. You know, one of the things that I find absolutely amazing is this, uh, despite the job losses, uh, the, the global economy actually has done quite well. Uh, the stock market has done quite well. So that's, um, that, uh, that, that, that's, that's my gig. Erica. Thank That's you so my much. Calling, my purpose. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia. I'm going to turn it over now to our student, Dr. Jessica, and she's been. Um, we've been collecting live questions from the audience, and so we have a few 
for our speakers. Jessica? Thank you so much, Dr. Newman, and thank you to our speakers who have already, we've had a very powerful and inspiring discussion. Um, like Dr. Newman said, we have some great questions from the audience. Um, so our first question to Dean Taylor, um, how can we think about utilizing community engagement principles in education research? And so also, what's the impact on our pipelines from a lack of inclusion at the table in higher education research? Fabulous questions. Uh, do we have a couple of hours? Uh, obviously not. <laughs> so let's start with the community engagement. Uh, one, of the, one of the components I like about the whole collaborative is that we saw already a great example of how to engage the community. Uh, and those community engagements can be initially uh, at our different institutions having community-based learning. So many of our institutions have moved nicely in that direction where our students will have an opportunity to engage the community around different health initiatives. Uh, we have students, for example, at Georgetown who do health prevention in middle schools. Uh, one of the uh, initiatives that brought tears to my eyes was uh, when our medical students went to a high school and talked about urban violence and how the students wrote letters back describing, as Dr. Garcia said, what the conditions are in their community and yet they're seeing someone vested in their growth and how they felt so responsive to that. And as a result, as Ms. Lewis Jackson said, they could see hope when times you think you're in an impossible situation. So I think we've done reasonably well with that piece in terms of moving toward more uh, real world experiences for our student doctors who will be working in our very communities to actually invest in the community and build those relationships. And that's part of, uh, of our educational curriculum, uh, but we would like to see that, of course, more in terms of intentional pipeline opportunities, which now, of course, spend more time with those young people in the community longitudinally over time, right? Like the P20 initiative. So we do need to expand those type of initiatives. When we get to the other side, which is, what I like to refer to as resource allocation and policy, right? So policy is gonna drive where the resources go. And again, this can be as complex, Dr. Schaefer said, you can look at systems levels, um, or it can be at a very base level. And this is where I go back to again, where the types of leaders, as we share through this symposium, not only with uh, students who are in training, with other scholars, but we actually need leaders now who come to the table to frame the discussions and help frame the policy. And as I always say, this is more than a notion because you have to have opportunities to help train people to go in and navigate those types of situations. So that one's a little bit more challenging uh, because if I take my own case, uh, being at Georgetown for 31 years, I'm the only African-American male dean. And before I was a dean, I didn't have a seat at the table. The saying goes, if you're now on the inside, you're on the outside. Once I was at the table, I could, through my voice and through my actions, redirect policies and redirect resources that then could go toward these type of collaborative initiatives we've been talking about. And so, Diversity of excellence, I believe, at the table is also the key that we have to promote um, within our respective institutions. And as we all know, that's a larger discussion. But that's going to be a key component to, as Dr. Newman was asking in the earlier question, how do we have institutions consider a program like GEMS or other initiatives? And at the same time, as Dr. Garcia is challenging us, wouldn't it be wonderful one day where we wouldn't need a GEMS program because valued students from all communities would have the same opportunities based on how those communities receive resources for education, resources for their uh, personal development, resources for their cognitive development. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could get to that point? And so what we find ourselves doing, and I was really thinking about Dr. Garcia's comment there because it is, it is the nature of the push, right? As I said, it keeps them motivated. 
we find ourselves doing these, what we would like to refer to as immediate interventions or reactive, right? Reactive programming because we haven't gotten to the root cause yet. And he has challenged us and reminded us, along with other scholars, even though the problem seems complex, we need to embrace that complexity. So we need two trains running, a train that gives them real-time, short-term solutions that have typically been reacted to the process because we haven't gotten to the core problem while we have scholars who are working on getting us to the core problem, and therefore we can reallocate resources appropriately. And so sometimes we say, when you look at the enormity of a challenge, you say, my goodness, that will never change. Let me just, you know, let me just focus, you know, somewhere else. However, if we can take a step back and again, that's why hope is so important. If we take a step back and say, where can I, where can I, with my gifts and talents, play a role in the whole process? There are going to be some great people who can get to the root cause, as Dr. Garcia and others are pushing. There are going to be some great people uh, like Dr. Boyd, who helps us remember how to shape our beliefs appropriately that inspires people to change from one direction and advocate for another direction, right? As an example, Dr. Marsh helped us to be intentional. Where can we be intentional based on where we are in our professional careers right now? You see, so we all have a way that we can work along this continuum because that's the only way it's gonna be solved. And so we see it's complex, but there's a role for everyone and if we stay with it, as we have all seen, we have had a lot of improvement over the years, uh, but we're still not where we're supposed to be. And so it's gonna take more engagement and more opportunities such as this symposium to share the best practices and to then inspire people to move in what they can do in the process. Thank you so much, Dean Taylor. And I love that everyone contributing um, kind of what they can to, to really make a big impact, I think is something that's really powerful. Our next question from the audience is for Dr. Schaefer. So for this one, um, they're asking, could you describe some concrete examples of how poverty might impact health in someone's life, but also vice versa, ways that poor health might lead to poverty? So when we think about poverty, we often think about not having enough resources, uh, or, you know, go in and tr trying to figure out on how to live on too little. Another big aspect of poverty, and perhaps even more important, is its volatility. So we often, you know, in the poverty sphere, we talk about the working poor, the deep poor, and there, there's not as much sort of clear differentiation between those as we often think. Um, people who are working in jobs are often working in unstable jobs, uh, jobs where schedules sort of go up and down, right? Uh, as a retailer or a service sector employer is trying to deal with their employment costs. And that's hard to manage, right? So the typical experience of a low-income family in the United States is not just sort of a steady low income, it's often huge swings where your income might go up and down up to 50%, uh, one direction or the not. And, and then our, our safety net actually exacerbates that. Whereas your earnings go up, uh, many of the programs that we have uh, decline. And so you might sort of see your earnings grow, but your food assistance uh, goes down. And it's really hard to manage. So you think about uh, Dr. Garcia's mention of toxic stress and how that sort of ripples through, right? It's sort of a heightened sort of sense of anxiety and how all this instability basically exacerbates that. And I think our, our science is not at the point where we can say that affects people's health, their physical health, right? It can um, affect uh, mental health, uh, but right down into the physical health of like wearing the body down that uh, all of this instability and sometimes it manifests itself into, you know, housing instability as well, where people are, you know, especially among families with kids, we think of homelessness as, you know, folks maybe being on the street 
or maybe being in a in a shelter for families with kids it also means like doubling up couch surfing from day to day, week to week. And what that means, you know, especially for like a kid who doesn't know where they're going to be sleeping the next night, makes it that much more difficult to focus on that test, right? And then the, the next day in school, the math test or the, the reading test. And um, so all of these things have sort of this cumulative effect, right? And then you layer on top of it uh, communities. And if there's, if there's violence, right? And then that sort of like increasing this the stress component as well. And then the health, right, uh, impacts poverty as, as we know families um, are often struggling with um, the sort of the fallout, right, of those, of all of what I just described and it manifests itself in, in disabilities, makes it more difficult then to um, access uh, and, you know, keep jobs over long term. And maybe you can access something like uh, um, SSI, right, or, or disability insurance. But those supports are basically set, you know, if you're lucky enough to get those, they're set at a level that sort of keep you maybe out of the deepest uh, cash income poverty, but, but certainly not as sort of a point of being able to um, survive, uh, you know, at a comfortable place, right? So there's still going to be anxiety um, at that sort of, you know, slightly higher up the rung, but still really far down. So, you know, I think uh, social scientists, we are obsessed with causality and trying to figure out X impacts Y, but here you're definitely in a space where X impacts Y and Y impacts X, right? And they sort of go back and forth. Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. And then our next question, um, Dr. Garcia, is our actual poll two results came back. So that question was, how much do you think changing of spatial poverty during childhood can impact a person's earnings as an adult? Um, and our audience had thought, actually 60% of our audience um, thought it could increase earnings by 60% or have a 60% effect on it. And your talk, I believe, showed 30%, which is still a dramatic and effect it can have. Can you talk a little bit more about how we need to be thinking about how children's neighborhoods can already adjust the start line for their future earnings um, and their lives? Uh, sure, so, um, and this is not my opinion, this is what the research shows. Again, I go back to Chetty and as well as others, as far as Duncan and Magnuson, uh, and that is by just changing the neighborhood. Um, and again, we can look at it as either moving out into a less less poor neighborhood or moving up, as Rob Sampson says. So uh, the economist Chetty's uh, moving to opportunities uh, study, building on the moving into opportunities showed that if you move a family out to a low poor neighborhood, that there was an increase not only in earnings on the part of that child when he approaches adulthood, uh, but also lower uh, incidences of teenage pregnancy uh, and um, uh, uh, and predominantly a sense of well-being. Uh, you know, the limitation of that uh, moving to opportunity study, uh, again, which was federally funded of, of interest, uh, was that uh, there was not really a change in economic outcomes or economic improvement on the part of uh, some of those families. And the other particularly interesting thing uh, that raises another question for the young students in this in this audience is, is that there was gender uh, uh, there were gender differences so that girls were more likely to benefit as a result of moving out of a high poverty neighborhood to a low, poor, po low poverty north neighborhood. Uh, that gender vulnerability is something that uh, not only Bruce McEwen at the Rockefeller Foundation, lately deceased, uh, but also Robert Sapolsky has also uh, sort of uh, uh, um, has also addressed and that black boys are much more susceptible uh, much more vulnerable. Uh, but to answer your question directly is, is that if you change that spatial context, uh, it's, I think, fairly well established that there is improvement in economic outcomes. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why James Heckman uh, co-authored that article with James, uh, with Jack Shonkoff and others, uh, that uh, really he came to the realization that we need to sort of look at the environment changes uh, if we're really going to sort of prepare the workforce of America for the future. 
the the other thing that I really want to I, I really want to emphasize uh, this whole idea about toxic stress, uh, allostatic load. Uh, please take a look at that because when I was first introduced to that by Martha Farah when she made a presentation to Congress in two thousand eight. Uh, in her presentation, uh, she's really said, you know, we need to think about uh, neurocognitive science ethics because the findings that she had were so profound as far as the impact at a very young age that lasts for a life that it really is not just a matter of science, but a matter of ethics. It is an ethical issue. Uh, that uh, we now know the consequences of relative deprivation in this country when you're surrounded by neighborhoods with who are very affluent and then you have these neighborhoods by segregation uh, are extremely poor. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the findings of, uh, you know, McEwen and Sapolsky and others as far as the effect on the brain development, brain architecture as early as one month of age, even in a healthy African-American female, I think cannot be ignored as far as how we look at preparing the pipeline, those coming into the pipeline. Uh, it's just egregious what we're doing in this country. Uh, and we, we cannot wait. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia. And the last question that I have for each of the panelists um, with the couple minutes that we have left in this Q&A is what advice do each of you have for trainees, um, medical students, or an M4 about going to residency? Um, and what in, how, if they're wanting to make an impact, what advice would you give to them? And we can start um, with Dr. Garcia. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the things that you need to try to do is sort of um, be a continued learning, an adult learner. Um, but when you encounter that child, what you bring in, whether it's a child or it's an adult, uh, ask the question not only about what's wrong with that particular person as far as their disease now, but also uh, expand your questioning uh, and your sensitivity and your empathy to where they, from whence they came. Uh, and... Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, appreciate that um, as, as, as you engage in their, in your um, uh, interviewing them uh, as to sort of wondering what, what, you know, what constraints do they have? What are the limitations uh, based on where they live uh, that might be impacting the illness presentations uh, when they sit before you in, in the examining room? Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia. And I'm Dr. Schaefer. I would just build on that and say, I, I totally agree. Just trying to think what's presenting to me beyond what I'm seeing right in this moment. And we often say that uh, the process at, at the organization I run starts with asking questions. And really, um, I know in a lot of your cases, you have only minutes, right? But really trying to ask questions and not assume that you know uh, the answers. Right. And not assume that you exactly know what's going on the second someone comes in, you know, as we've done our work in uh, Detroit, working with the mayor on trying to tackle some of these structural uh, challenges of poverty. We ended up writing a whole, you know, set of work on the high cost of auto insurance and what that means uh, in the city of Detroit for people's ability to have a car and not risk sort of a very large uh, fine and fee because the state has increased all of those costs because they're short on revenue and, um, and you know, forcing them to make that, you know, tough decisions about, you know, all sorts of things. And that's just one of those things I never would have thought, you know, when we started doing our work that I would be writing about auto insurance policy. So what are the things that are going to surprise you? And what are the things when we sort of get out of our positionalities uh, as, a, as, a, as a doctor, as, as the expert, and really try to do a little bit more listening that we can learn and, 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 and improve what we do? Wonderful. And then Dean Taylor. Never underestimate the time that you invest in someone else's health. Never under, underestimate the time that you spend uh, demonstrating compassion and empathy uh, to your value patients. Never underestimate your gifts and talents, no matter how complex the problem, 
how you can contribute to the solution. Never underestimate what you have to offer in time and service. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Really, thank you to our speakers who've just been very powerful and inspiring.